as we cover many an insane movie and numerous cult TV phenomena. Are you ready to get jacked up? Are you with us? Then listen on. Welcome. We got two different authors and great talents on here. We got Lindsay G returning again. <laughs> Hi. And then we got C. Courtney Joyner. How are you, buddy? <laughs> oh, just fine. This is this is very exciting. Uh, by all means. Uh, so yeah, to, today I just figured we just do just kind of a. Uh, another natural chat and just on in general just on uh just our favorite just villains and uh, just badasses <laughs> just yeah. people who, are just ruthless, who we just rooted for their comeuppance or who we secretly wanted to get away with <laughs> it's an evil episode today so uh, yeah. uh just kind of before we start off what do you guys look for when you want a good villain who just makes you feel like, you know, just the characters are overwhelmed and there's just no good way out. There's no light at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> mm. Mm. That's a good question. Because no, that's often the argument. Uh, your movie is only as yeah. good as the villain. And if the villain is just uninspired or just disappears into the background in favor of the various explosions and comedy or terror, then it gets pretty old pretty fast so yeah it's i can i can tell i mean and then we'll 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 circle back around i guess but um i was um uh, uh fortunate enough to and this is a little bit of a hollywood you know story and so um, i am being a bit of a hollywood <laughs> jerk so i apologize for that <laughs> uh Anyway, I was I was fortunate enough to to be invited to the uh, memorial service for the director Don Siegel, and uh, Andy Robinson, who played the killer in Dirty Harry, uh, was very is very good friend of mine. In fact, his wife was uh, at the time was my agent, and I was with sitting on, with them. You worked with him on Transfers Free, right? That's right. And I was sitting with them, and Clint Eastwood comes over, and you know, and I read it once or twice, but. He sat he sat down with us and they started talking about the fact that Andy had never been cast in any movie with Eastwood since they did Dirty Harry. And, uh, you know, and of course, they had run into each other and what have you. But it was interesting to hear them both say that the impression that Andy had made in that movie was so strong that it was impossible for them to ever be on screen together again. Yeah. <laughs> and because the the old movie would immediately flash in everybody's mind and you'd have this preconceived notion because you look at that film and the thing about that aside from the fact that it's just miles ahead of all the sequels even if you know they're kind of cheesy fun but you look at that movie and one of the reasons it works so extremely well first of all it's a serious movie it's not the you know the silly stuff that that the films descended into yeah is that andy is the great unknown first of all not only was he a fresh face but everybody forgets man he beats the hell out of eastwood in that movie 
yeah. several times. Mm -hmm. And suddenly there's this thing of, wait a minute, it, it's, there's a real threat here. This is not just a straw man to knock down. And that's why the movie works so well. And I think that, and we go, just go back, and I, I came up with my whole list of, you know, uh, villains and badasses that I like going back so far. But I think that's really the thing that isn't that like the core element that it's, it is something like that's genuine, not just kind of a blank figure that can be shot or punched or, no. you know. Push out a window a sniper or that, to uh, add to that. So that yeah. kind of, I mean, he was already kind of a, would you say he was kind of more of a, ah, what's the word for it? I mean, obviously he's a serial sniper, but yeah, he was kind of inspired by uh, the Night Stalker, I guess, a bit, but, and other oh. killers at that time, like uh, the Zodiac. Well, well, the thing, the original scripts, uh, way back when Frank Sinatra was going to do it and all these different people, even when John Milius had worked on it, uh, they were still following what they thought was the secret life of Zodiac and that he was like a middle-aged businessman who had this whole life with a family and kids in mm -hmm. suburbia and all this stuff, and then he would secretly go out at night and shoot people. Which is why no one could identify him. He just did exactly, it and they really well. kept to that for a very long time in draft after draft after draft after draft. But it was actually only after uh, Eastwood and Siegel both saw Andy in a play at the recommendation of Don Siegel's son, uh, Chris. Oh Moore, man, that they decided to change their approach. Huh. And I mean, this is the same guy who's you know one of the main villains in the first Hellraiser and <laughs> later yeah. gets made oh, the sure, Diner in Deep Space yeah. Nine. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I was just going to bring up Garrick, who That's I right. think has a... Garrick isn't positioned as a villain, um, but he's certainly, certainly positioned as a badass. But um, his oh, character <laughs> takes kind of so long to unravel to the point that viewers even think they can kind of figure out what his motivation right. might be. <laughs> and you still get to the end of the series and you really don't know. And you sometimes really know. he does yeah. play a villain role. Sometimes he is a savior or sometimes he's a friend. And um, I think that that level of complexity, I mean, you certainly don't see it very often in sci-fi on television. <laughs> no, not at um, all. And it, I mean, Star Trek is a good jumping point because I mean, the writers would always say of any of those shows would always say it was the same deal every time we can talk about anything and no one will bitch. No one will complain <laughs> because it's in sci-fi form. And so, yeah, you look at the Cardassians and the Bajorans and it's like, I always kind of got a Bosnian and Serbian kind of angle from that. Oh, definitely, yeah. Muslims and Jews. And it's like nowadays it's definitely Palestinian Israelis. <laughs> you know? sure. What yeah. we're seeing now on the Twitter wars is like, yeah, it is like, these are two cultures who, you know, good luck finding any common ground. They, the, the prejudice between their two cultures is just so massive. And it is kind of wild because, yeah, Garrick is, you know, just joking one day and other times, you know, is willing to take someone as a hostage and say, oh, but I wasn't going to kill you. I was just using you to my advantage and the fear. Yeah. Didn't you trust fun. me? Shouldn't shouldn't you have trusted me this whole entire time? All yeah. right. And everybody just doesn't know what to make of them before they ally with them because, I mean, in that one episode where the Borg make an appearance, he literally is just like stabbing the shit out of one of them. <laughs> and it's just like, man, okay, dude, it's dead. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, I forgot about that. If, if he was still alive, this would be a war crime by now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I'm going to go with Vic Mackey on The Shield, played to perfection okay. by Michael Chiklis, who described the character as Hannibal Lecter meets uh, uh, Tony Soprano. And I'm like, yeah, that is absolutely who he is, because, <laughs> you know, he, he he's he's a vice cop, but he's not respected, and he stops so much crime, but under just so much just ruthlessness, and then he just, you know, he'll always find a way to hustle, like steal from Armenian and gangsters and everything, money and drugs, and <laughs> it's just like, man, it, he has no shame, and there's just no reason uh, there no. It, it makes sense why he's just not respected by anybody, <laughs> oh, except those who he befriends. 
Uh, the show is still on Hulu for anyone who wants to see it and can break through it. I know it's hard to watch on today's standards, but it's still, it's a, man, just growing up in college when I saw that show, I was just like, man, it, it kind of, the show really did remind me of some of the other stuff I was watching around that same point, like SVU or Oz. And it's like, you can uh, show a bunch of characters and just show, like, Vic, you did kind of just secretly want to see, will he get away with all this stuff that he is outlining for us? Because it's just, it, you ne he just would change his persona by episode. And you just, mm -hmm. I'm being a man of a dozen faces, you know, to see that much, just, again, shamelessness and so much sinister mentality about him. is like, yeah, you didn't know what you were in for each episode. And so... I wanted to binge it at one point and I almost literally got a headache because it just, it's just so intense. There's years before we had stuff like Breaking Bad and all that. It was just so much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Take all that. <laughs> huh. That's really interesting because I've never watched The Shield because when I was, I don't know, I guess I was like in middle school. That's around when, when it was in. Yeah. <laughs> when he was on the commish. Oh, and there you go, yeah. <laughs> I used to, you know, like, it wasn't, like, my favorite show, but sometimes, you know, I'd catch an episode of it when it was on TV, and it was, like, you know, a police procedural, but, like, kind of heartwarming, and, you know, like, standard Copy. prime time fair. Yeah. And I remember being, like, oh, you know, you know, I have, like, fuzzy feelings about that guy. So I remember when The Shield started up, and they were putting him in this completely different light. I was just, like, oh, I don't know about this. I don't feel like that's gonna, <laughs> I don't feel like he has it in him. You know? That's why he and... almost didn't get the uh, role. The, the director was like, yeah, no, I don't see him playing a killer. But uh, the actor shaved his head, lost some weight by going to the gym. And the next thing you know, everybody's like, wow. Well, <laughs> I, I am not sure if I agree with this all the time, but my partner, JL, has a theory that sometimes the best villains are the people who are actually the nicest. Like, that there's something about, like, right. having to completely, like, <laughs> like, to be able to look at a bad guy and figure out what's going on there, but not actually feel the way that the bad guy feels. I'm not really sure if I believe that, but I think that there is something about, like, especially actors who have embodied a nice guy role, and, like, you've gotten comfortable with it. There's something so much more unsettling about seeing them play a villain. Like, um... Right. Especially dark comedies we've seen and other stuff like that, like right. Secession right now. You got all these Wall Street tycoon guys who are just clueless as to how, how just, uh, you know, re repulsive everything that they're mentioning is. And so that that's <laughs> even funny, too, how it's like you can. Yeah, I mean, you need a special kind of actor who can do just kind of other little subtle uh, nuances and that complement what the tone that the script is going for. And, well, yeah. let's also cut to the chase and say that many actors who play nice guys are assholes. So, <laughs> yeah, no, it is funny how that has been pretty common. Yeah, that's, guys that's yeah. Like, oh, I love you. Yes. What did you do after that show? Oh, everybody hated working with him. And same deal is like, yeah, the guys who is like, man, he really did a convincing job playing that rapist or that <laughs> serial killer yeah. is like. And, oh, but he's and the nice guys guy. <laughs> who had specialized or built their careers playing bad guys were always just terrific people. <laughs> I found. Yeah, I have that's many so friends interesting. Who played bad guys in movies, and uh, they are Cause, great. Because literally, all they have to do is just smirk evilly and <laughs> say fucked up shit and try not to laugh. <laughs> <laughs> well, the one that I'm curious about, and this might be the top of my my villains list is Anthony Hopkins oh, there because you go. Hannibal Lecter just I mean I I can't <laughs> think of a character in a in a live action there might be some animated characters like I think Disney does amazing villains a lot of the time but if we're talking live action movies I don't think I that I can come up with another villain that is so creepy and literally terrifying but also compelling like i want to know what's going on in his head at every moment and i think that that is a testament to anthony hopkins talent but it also makes me really curious about what anthony hopkins is like as a human being <laughs> well he's he's very nice so that's yeah. that's yes he is that's but you hear. know yeah i think that one of the things with silence of the lambs that is so remarkable 
is, uh, and of course I love the novel, Thomas Harris just mm -hmm. knocks me off my feet, but Hopkins was so well known and was so established when he played that part as obviously was Jodie Foster. So, and he was able to transcend his celebrity with that performance, which is not always something that can be done yeah. because you see that now the sequels, the, you know, it went kind of haywire and all that stuff. And, uh, you know, everybody has to make a living. So, Right, much like Dr. Hey, Dirty Harry. They, they got yeah. it right the first time, and then they just kind of kept, you know... Exactly. Let's yeah. go but, for cheap frills versus well-thought-out frills, so... <laughs> you know, but the, th but the thing is that, for me, the... Because the, I love Silence of the Lambs. I, I think it, Demi and everybody just did a remarkable job. But I'll tell you what, scary... Lecter, I go to Brian Cox in Manhunter. He was unbelievable. Huh. I he, still have not seen that. I have a DVD of it in the other room, but I don't have a DVD player anymore. So, <laughs> so it's just been sitting there. Oh, man. Someday. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's a goodie. And, I mean, Tom Noonan's other main killer is already. Oh, Tom Noonan. Dragon. Oh, my gosh. Francis Dollarhide. I should like I've to seen take it. you home. Yes. Didn't they say he was basically doing Lecter's uh, bidding for him while Lecter rots in prison? Yes. Or was he just a copycat or admirer? But yeah, it's like, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's definitely a good example of just, I mean, there's plenty of Criminal Minds villains I like. Yes, there's some that don't really work and are just too Hollywood. But I mean, yeah, I mean, when you can conduct a killer and actually just show how uh, they operate and think without just feeling uh, like it's just, you know, them pulling random headlines and trying to cater to just silly fantasy, you know, you, you, you know that you have something good on your hands, you know, whatever also, formula. Is it also the unknown factor? Because, you know, uh, Columbia Pictures offered Richard Brooks a bloody fortune if he would cast either Steve McQueen or Paul Newman as one of the killers in In Cold Blood. Oh, man. And he said, that's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> because you're not going to be afraid of them. I don't care how great an actor they are. You know, Steve McQueen or Paul Newman shows up at your house at one o'clock in the morning. You're not going to be scared. Scott Wilson, and Robert Blake show up. That's a whole nother thing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, especially uh, it, then, because, I mean, people have forgotten Bobby Blake as a child actor and Treasure of Sierra Madre and all that stuff. And, mm -hmm. you know, he'd been in some some things you know as an adult obviously and scott wilson was a brand new face he had just had his first film and in the heat of the night right and so you know uh that's what made it so as uh, also the fact is he was just an absolute i mean dead ringer for uh for hickok which was astonishing but uh you know that's that's the thing it's it's what made it work so beautifully uh, is the unknown factor is that yeah. these are these people are strangers to us. We can't call on, and that doesn't mean that that's the case every time because Robert Ryan is one of my favorite actors. He played badasses and villains his whole career, but uh, and always convincingly. But when you get into that kind of murderous thing or that great unknown factor, you you I think it works better if you have an unknown face. It really can. Fun. And yeah. at that time, audiences were only used to just whoever you, what they first saw or knew you as, they wanted you to kind of just keep playing that kind of role. Sure. So we would see so many people just be complained about, oh, they got typecast. They're only that limited. I'm like, well, we didn't really know. They didn't really have, some of those guys didn't have a chance to stretch. But yeah, it was like Paul Newman, the closest you're going to get to probably seeing him play a bad guy was probably in HUD. You know, it's just. Oh, God. Yeah. And he is so magnificent in that movie. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the unknown factor makes me think of uh, Alan Rickman in Die Hard. Right. Yep. What I, was, I hear is he was basically a stage actor before that, and they just picked him up and said, you know what, you're going to be this villain. And Hans Gruber is now like top tier villainy, even in, you know, a relatively silly movie, I think. Um, yeah, I, but... I, I hope that he won't 
fall to his death every Christmas when I watch that damn movie. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, you basically took what was a James Bond kind of villain, and yeah, I just had him. And what, what who was really just yeah, is like just a a German special forces ex special forces guy who decided to just organize a bunch of thieves together. <laughs> it's just like, yeah, yeah he he, had, he did have a good plan. <laughs> Yeah, and he's he's utterly irredeemable. Like, there's nothing about him that you like, no. but in the end, you do kind of like him. Because <laughs> he I'm can not... be charismatic one minute before he yeah. threatens to blow everyone's brains off. So right. it's like, that's kind of the fun of it. And I definitely saw that echoed in the Pierce Brosnan Bond films and certain mm-hmm. seasons of 24 when they got certain other British guys like Julian Sands. And I was like, yeah, they're, they are catering to that Alan Rickman persona for sure. Definitely. But then then if we're talking Alan Rickman, then we've got to talk about Severus Snape also. I mean, right. very different movie. And you could probably, you know, in like Harry Potter fan forums, go on for hours about whether he's actually a villain or a hero, et cetera. But it the was way so wild to he... see a kid's movie even go there, you know, because they didn't really typically do that, you know? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, and the way that he portrayed know. that character was so compelling, even in the early movies when he was just a bad guy. We didn't know anything else about him except that he was a jerk. And then we found out that he's a Death Eater. You know, he's not likable. <laughs> and yet, Alan Rickman just brought so much charisma and, I don't I don't know, whatever magic he worked to that role that you always wanted to see more Snape. And then at the end, it was like, oh, thank God, he was kind of a good guy this whole time. I don't feel so bad for liking him so much. <laughs> right. But isn't that like in, the, in the, that tradition of you know, James Mason in North by Northwest or Claude Rains and Notorious or, you know, anything yeah, those like are that. good examples. How about Claude Rains in anything? But yeah, he, yeah. <laughs> he definitely had kind of a Basil Rathbone kind of look. And then, yeah, that kind of cunning nature that you definitely get from any Hitchcock villain. <laughs> just to see him, like you say, yeah, just keep his true agenda very secretive just throughout the movie and only give hints of it to those who he trusts <laughs> and without giving way too much away or to sure, where well, you know, is. lighting your cigarette and offering you a drink and all that stuff. And yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I guess if we're going to go there, we've already talked about Hannibal. Uh, how many of you, <laughs> when we were talking about snipers too, uh, how about the caller in phone booth? I really like phone booth. Oh, absolutely. Uh, but yeah, I, I Definitely got a seven Silence of the Lambs approach from it, and just the fact that you don't see Kiefer Sutherland for most of the time, and yet his voice is very chilling. Yes. Uh, Kiefer Sutherland. Yeah. You know, he's a good one to bring up, actually. Um, <laughs> he's played plenty of bad guys. <laughs> well, I'm just, the thing that I always think of him in is um, Stand By Me, when he plays oh, the, God, yeah. the, basically the gangster teenager like Give psychopath kid. <laughs> yeah he is truly terrifying in that movie like it, oh, it yeah. really unsettles me oh totally and what well, what i guffawed so much about what earlier season of 24 is that they needed a random portrait to show his military career so they had a photo of his bad guy in uh, uh a few good men so I was like, oh, I see. So he got—he probably got trained by another great villain, Jack Nicholson's Colonel Jessup. <laughs> ah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Nicholson, I always get into arguments with my friends because, I'll be honest with you, I agree with Nicholson, not with Tom Cruise. <laughs> <laughs> I, stu- I stood by that. I didn't yeah. you need me on that wall. <laughs> yeah. And, oh, uh, God. <laughs> because it is, it's like well, it's like what you're bringing up with the shield, and you know the idea of the rogue, who is basically a tool of higher ups because they know this is somebody who will kick down a door. This is somebody who will walk into a bullet, and, and, and the they're not always the most honorable guys, but they are the necessary guys. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, I mean, and that's just it. I mean. They bring up so many conversations even days after you've seen these plays or these movies or read these books. And it's like, yeah, I mean, people like Jessup and Vic have basically been engineered 
because of all the systematic wrongs that have been going on for decades where, you know, young kids sign up early, don't know what they're getting into and get abused by their, you know, privates in the army or who just flat out just say, hey, to win the war, I got to basically be like the enemy or who I oh, view yeah. the enemy to be. I got to be flat out anal retentive. I got to be psycho. And anyone who gets in my way, oh, I will fuck you up. And just the fact that he just basically has all these guys basically, you know, hang one of his privates who has been speaking out of turn and fo not following his orders. He's like, oh, I, I had to kill him. <laughs> He's in my way. And... And the fact that he brings all these NCIS JAG equivalent, you know, people just come to his base and say, hey, man, what's going on here? <laughs> um, well, you know, when when you get into that and you say uh, uh, another a great example, of course, we talking about rogue cop, uh, the French connection. And yeah. Popeye Doyle, yeah. Popeye Doyle, and of course, Eddie Egan was the model for that character, and he's in the movie, as was his partner, Sonny Grosso. And um, that's the thing. I mean, these are, you know, these are really rough guys dealing with even rougher guys. And that was the whole, that was, it's the whole conundrum of how far do you go? What do you excuse but of course, we're not the ones who are walking into the room facing a dozen guns. Oh, very but much they so. Are. And it is very interesting to see how so many people just get, you know, caught up with all these other guys, and it, it becomes impossible to get, like, when you're investigating, to get even a proper story, to even know, you know, who, who did whatever wrongdoing or who was well-intended and then stepped out of line. And it is even more so because it's like everybody's broken a rule or done something they're not supposed to. It just became a matter of, okay, so how big was the offense? You know? <laughs> right. Exactly. And of course I'll, I'll, I'll go a, a personal favorite badass, and then, I'll, then I'll shut up. Cause we'll just open this up. Uh, somebody <laughs> who steps out of line constantly, but, dare I say it, is so charming and incredibly good-looking <laughs> that he gets away with it. And, of course, I'm, I'm thinking about Tim Oliphant and Justified. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah. No, good, good pick. Yeah, uh, I could hear him read the phone book for yeah. days. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think Tim Oliphant is such an interesting actor because he plays bad scary guys and really really nice guys both so well <laughs> like, oh, totally. creepy well um like uh i always think of oh god what's that show that he recently did with drew barrymore um oh, uh, santa uh, clarita diet, diet. Yeah. yeah where he is just the gosh darn wholesomest just friendliest most supportive husband in the entire world <laughs> and then you know, you look at some of his other work, and it, I, I just, I'm like scratching my head about how, how I feel about this guy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, what's he hiding? You know. <laughs> oh, totally. And I mean, as kind of a, you know, you had other people who kind of went just beyond the bounds and basically destroyed themselves, like Walt on Longmire and Jack Bauer on Twenty Four. But with him, it was really interesting just seeing him basically compliment a lot of the off-color humor you get in an Elmore Leonard novel and yeah. even previous adaptations and just seeing just, just to see him just kind of just, he's so used to taking on these basic, you know, uh, uh, bandits and KKK affiliates mm -hmm. and uh, even just other just petty white trash and minorities who are just robbing people for just the most ridiculous things. <laughs> and it's like, it's all second nature to him. He's like, yep. Uh, I've heard this story a hundred times and it ends every time with either, will you come with me or will I draw my gun? That's it's, it. You draw, I, I'll put you down. I and, will talk, but eventually the curtains are coming up and I will have to end this. <laughs> that's right. And well, you know, they're shooting the new uh, justified right now. Yeah. The follow up. I, I can't yep. wait. And yeah, it's going to be very in interesting. Um, so uh, if we're talking about Timothy Oliphant, <laughs> then we got to bring up Deadwood. And if we bring oh, up yeah. Deadwood, we got to talk about Ian McShane. 
<laughs> Al Swearington. Oh man. Al Swearingen. Uh, like when that character, specifically when Ian McShane as that character is on screen, I cannot look away from him. Like he, I don't know. He just has this gravity around him, and the way that he, <laughs> like I. I never thought I would be so compelled by someone saying cocksucker repeatedly. And yet <laughs> here we are. And I just can't get enough of it. Like, yeah, he starts off as just another simple, ruthless brothel owner. And then he just moves his way up and then it gets even kind of darkly humorous for lack of a better term. Cause I mean, you got this, you know, Montana mining town that, you know, South it's pretty Dakota. lawless. It's got all these other conflict of interest and other ruthless businessmen. It's so funny. I would have thought for the longest time Powers Booth's character was going to be more biased. And then as the show goes on, you're like, he's kind of a worse character than him. Well, <laughs> that's kind extent. of the thing about that show is like, it's just levels of bad. <laughs> like, like yeah. even, you know, Tim Oliphant's character is ostensibly the good guy, but he is deeply, deeply flawed. I think possibly the only really good guy on the show, interestingly enough, is Doc Cochran, who's played by Brad Dourif. He oh, made yeah, his career Joe... as playing a bad guy, like on bit roles on TV shows. Right, Chucky. Well, I mean that in one third. <laughs> and just the fact that you got all these other people who are basically pretty mental or dying from smallpox, and all these other callous types who just are just selfish as can be. And it's kind of even funnier how just all these other people who you think would be the hero, you know, just have. Uh, you know, just die so miserably, just like the supposed characters they're based on actually did. Like, while Bill, you know, just gets killed over the most easily avoidable circumstance, <laughs> which is getting robbed at a card game. And it's just yeah. like, with, when he dies, his, his spirit doesn't live on. Basically, everybody's just like, now just they're panicking. They can't rely on him to break up a bar fight anymore. <laughs> right, yeah. And, and so, actually, yeah. The other good character in that show we've got to bring up is uh, Calamity Jane. Who, oh yeah, uh, like heart of gold, deeply, deeply, deeply flawed. And I think that's what I love so much about that show is like, even the good guys, you know, they don't they don't live up to the hero stature that you're often looking for in a western. And that's I think what makes that show so interesting. Yeah, because like Seth Bullock, Oliphant's character kind of does some policing, but he's also unfortunately you know the devil's in the details with the people he's <laughs> doing business with. So yeah, but yeah, Calamity Jane, you know, is also basically. <laughs> She is having to, again, just go against all these pigs, all these, you know, atrocious types who, again, just and, and just say, hey, you will not abuse me. No, sir. <laughs> yeah, I, I absolutely loved that character in that show. It's uh, the actor's name, Rob, Robin Weigert. Robin Weigert, yeah. Robin, and yeah, she was you look phenomenal. at her picture and you're like, I, I, I would have not recognized her. <laughs> <laughs> right, like, no, uh, <laughs> no way. <laughs> well, so you actually... Know, Oh, the, the movie was so tremendous. It was one of the best sign-offs for a series, I think, ever. I, I just thought the movie was fantastic. I actually haven't seen it yet, and I'm ashamed of myself. Oh, good. We'll get there. <laughs> <laughs> and, well, one of the things is Oliphant finally is old enough. And, see, okay, so it's post-Raylan given, so he can, he's actually seasoned enough to play that character because for some reason he was he felt too boyish to me. Mm. <laughs> I think that's kind of what they were going for, but I see what you mean. He did yeah, kind they yeah. did kind of need someone who was handsome who could but be kind had of some, had who could some argue miles. with the other guys. Yeah, <laughs> he had some miles behind him, and uh, yeah. now he does, and he is just he is stunningly good in the uh, in the movie, a yeah. as is everybody. Well, and I think most everyone at that point, they were either at the first or second stage of their career. So they just took that even more seriously. They're like, OK, we're going to take a lot and grow from this. You know, and we're on a major, you know, premium channel show. And yep. it's not a ratings hit, huh. but it's a Emmy's darling and, you know, yeah. getting all this acclaim each year. And I seriously could not go through a single newspaper without seeing some kind of poster for it each year when it premiered oh, and, sure. and you know and of course the pilot directed by walter hill and ac lyles producing an ac guy he was he was an old pistol but you know my god he goes back to working at publicity at paramount pictures you know in 1930 oh totally <laughs> and to see 
I mean, I think that's just it too. HBO wasn't as humble mm. about it as they were their other stuff because it was an out of studio production co owned by Paramount, much like Oz. And it was like, geez, yeah. okay, um, well, I think you guys should still look at the numbers and say it adds up. <laughs> People want more. <laughs> so I have, I have a another tie-in. I'm on IMDb, obviously. I'm just, like scrolling through <laughs> nice. and remembering who everybody is and placing all the characters. And I, I just was reminded that in Deadwood, Seth Bullock's wife, Martha Bullock, is played by Anna Gunn, who yes. was on Breaking Bad. And I oh, feel yeah. like we have to talk about Breaking Bad because... Bring up Skylar and Gus. And... <laughs> right. I remember that Skylar, played by Anna Gunn, was considered a villain by a large contingent yeah. of the Breaking Bad fandom when the show was on and I remember hearing about it. I didn't watch Breaking Bad until it was I think already over so I binged Sorry. the whole thing um, <laughs> and I could not for the life of me figure out why anyone would have a problem with her character like yeah. this poor woman she's doing the best she fucking can and they with... were making sopranos references and everything i'm like no not even it's like vic oh. you know he's bad and he has no shame about it but you want to see him basically get away with murder because you just know it's just going to be some other wtf plot twist tony let's be honest he's like scarface and godfather but here <laughs> is like yeah by those final seasons uh, how could anyone possibly think Walter is redeemable in any way, shape, or form. He has used people all his life. He's tried to do, he's exploited the family for so long as an example of this is why I can continually, you know, get away with my criminal activity. And now this is like Skylar knows what he's on to. And he's, he's like, yeah, you're going to either get us all tossed in prison or we're going to be dead because of your actions. We, we have to leave. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I thought she was brilliant. I thought that that, that her whole character arc made perfect sense, number one, and number two was just brilliantly performed, and the fact that she got dragged by the fans for basically, I feel like, being the woman in the show. Like, I just don't, I, I don't know what other, you know, excuse there is for hating that character. And um, Brian Cranston tried to combat that. He did the whole My yeah. Favorite Team Life at the Emmys, and it's just like, fans, some of those guys seem like they were literal psychos in the X-Cons. It's yeah. like, geez, you guys I, are taking this I too seriously. I feel serious. like there's a possibly a large segment of the Venn diagram where there's crossover between um, violent fans of specifically Walter White and Breaking Bad and Rick and Morty <laughs> where like they're not yeah. they're not picking up on the idea that this is not a character you should emulate it's actually the bad guy <laughs> right. don't do this with your life murder is um, justified I've gotten that way <laughs> with Chicago PD guys a bit it seems like some of them are like oh I love my voice I'm like oh Voight's technically a villain. <laughs> yeah, well, but I mean, that really brings us back to that whole thing about um, <laughs> actors who can play a good guy and a light role really well, which Brian Cranston did in Malcolm in the Middle, you know, as sort of a bubble <laughs> oh, yeah. nice guy dad. Everybody That's what everybody knew him as. So when he started on Breaking Bad, everybody was like, oh, look at this guy, what a sweetie. And boy, did he take us for a ride. <laughs> and I oh, really, I think it was oh, really no, well done. It, that's and you know when you talk about how certain characters develop into you know the heavies and you don't expect it at all laura linney in ozark is incredible oh good Love good laura linney. Linney, one of the top actresses of all time but yeah no that's that's a good parallel because ozark was by the guys who had written the other hit netflix show uh bloodline and I felt like Ozark, you know, Bloodline, that was kind of the rough draft. But yeah, Ozark, that was the final draft. And then some, <laughs> they they catapulted. They they flat out just found. I mean, you know, she's, she starts out, she's wringing her hands all the time because of what Jason Bateman's doing. Oh my gosh, what have you got us into? Now she like runs a criminal empire. <laughs> oh, awesome. totally. And it... It, the, all these shows, what they do a wonderful job at is just showing how eventually along the way someone's going to be a contrarian or just be like, well, how yeah. bad is bad? You know, well, what's the limit to what we can't do? What if we it comes to this and it erupts in violence? What if it, you know, one of us has to take the fall for everyone else's bullshit? <laughs> and, and, you know, and I love Bateman anyway. I mean, to jump between, say, horrible bosses and the gift 
this guy. Yes. Oh my <laughs> god. And let alone dysfunctional families like on Arrested Development. So yeah, that's what it was just so funny. Like you said, with Brian Cranston, he's done all this funny stuff where he's suspected of being a bad guy on Seinfeld, and then just the stupid dad on Malcolm in the Middle to then doing the crooked judge on Your Honor, and. And Walter White is like, yeah, total perfect for Bateman and Lenny. You know, she played, you know, unstable types like on Truman Show and the details and then just playing other lovable types. And so then to see again, like you say, just this about face. You know, I think with Laura Linney, one of the things maybe pushed uh, the casting of her because, I mean, of course, she's terrific, um, was that, I mean, she was like cold-blooded but so supportive in Mystic River. That's a good parallel. I don't think she would have done that as much had she not done that. And then being on Tales of the City was a big coming-of-age role. And it's like people are having to adapt to stuff that not even school can brace you for, uh, life (laughs) tragedies and romance. And then to be on the big C when she had an actual, like, real-life, Cancer scare. Oh, yeah. Then yeah. Yeah, and she's, she's great. She's very, yeah. she's very nice. And the thing is, too, what's great is she's like, you know, thank God people have finally forgotten Congo. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love me some Congo, but I know what you mean. Yeah, it's like to play a smart scientist and just what's otherwise a silly, cheesy hey, Indiana Zappa Jones knockoff. With a ray gun, you got to do it. Yep. <laughs> thank you, Stan Winston. Um, no, I mean, I think that's just it. I mean, and those are the best kind of actors who adapt, the ones who just uh, don't get pigeonholed, are willing to just say, hey, it is acting after all. You know, if I get to where, because I think that's just it too. Like some of them can get away with this brand, just playing like two to three different characters and everyone's happy. And then there's others who it's like, I got to reward everybody. I got to reward my fans who want to see what I can do as an actor. And I got to reward me because I'm going to get bored eventually playing whatever character for however how long. <laughs> and and then, like you say, I got to show that I can't be just restricted to anything. I can do just about anything that I set my mind to. And I think a lot of these guys, they're just, they, they have fortunately all had pretty good upbringing, pretty good lives, and just they instilled confidence in themselves. It's like, hey, I'm serious about this. You know, no time to be prima donna i, I gotta get busy <laughs> but you know when when something goes so horribly wrong and i am thinking very specifically about eli roth's remake of death wish <laughs> oh, did man. you see that goddamn thing i it, did see it in the theater it and it should oh my have, god oh, it shouldn't have even been called death wish it should have it, just been called it on shouldn't have been made. It's, it's like <laughs> To go so far afield of Brian Garfield's novel and make it even more so with Bruce Willis. And I kept saying, my friends, that we were talking about this, is, can you imagine how great that movie would have been with Jason Bateman playing that part? Maybe. I mean, or, I think it's... Ryan Reynolds or anybody who is not a veteran of Joel Silver movies. <laughs> It would have been interesting. No, I, I know what you mean. To get someone who you don't typically see in those kinds of stuff, I think Gary Cole could have worked. I think some oh, of these Gary, other- oh, absolutely. Anybody. And in fact, I'll I'll, I'll tell you a quick story. I uh, <laughs> okay. Back when they were doing the original movie, what was going on is Death Wish was cross collateralized by Dino De Laurentiis with Serpico. Right. And. Uh, the original director of Serpico was John Alvinson. Right, before Sidney LeMay took over. Yeah. That's right. And he and Pacino were not getting along. And Sidney <laughs> LeMay <Where's this> guy? <laughs> was preparing Death Wish with Jack Lemon. Oh, wow. <laughs> and, I thought it'd be Walter Matthau, but that works. <laughs> and so, you know, the mild mannered architect, all that stuff. And uh, Pacino said, you've got to get rid of Alvinson. This is not working out. Alvinson didn't like Pacino. So De Laurentiis made the switch, and he said, look, we want Lamette uh, over for Serpico. So suddenly Death Wish doesn't have a director. Don Siegel was hired. And Lemon, they knew each other, and it was fine. But Jack Lemon said, no, you know, I really wanted to do this with Sidney Lumet, so I'm going to step back. 
And when he did, then they had Henry Fonda in for a couple of minutes and different things. And then the whole thing, you know, started to fall apart. <laughs> but they needed to spend the money because, right. you know, if you don't spend the money for one, you can't spend the money for the other. And you had two movies going. They all got to get made. <laughs> that's it. And Brian Garfield, who I knew a little bit, said that one day he gets this phone call from Dino De Laurentiis. He goes over to Paramount. And De Laurentiis sat there, and he goes, okay, I've got the great news. We're doing a death wish with Michael Winner and a Charles Bronson. <laughs> and he said Brian Garfield just fell, fell to the floor because th that definitely didn't fit, you know, what— Oh, and uh, even as you see the sequels go on, it's like canon films. Those are totally guys who know what a narrative means. <laughs> it's like— yeah, but, You know, the, of course, they were— <laughs> They were going, he, he felt, you know, oh, my God, this was not the novel that I wrote. It's not anything. They said, De Laurentiis looked at him and said, you hate me now, but I just made you a millionaire. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. And I think that's just it. It's just like, it's kind of the same thing with The Punisher. This is a character that, till it got to Netflix, even then, just people just seem to, even investors, they, they don't know what makes a movie good. They just think, oh, just large body count and other shocking content. And it's just like <laughs> shocking content can be, again, excused for when you actually get to the, again, the end of the tunnel. And everybody just seems to just want to take a shortcut. It's like it, it's like the whole movie is in a paper bag. And if you want people to see it, just I'll just poke a few holes in it. There will be some light that will get in there eventually. <laughs> it's like, no, <laughs> uh, you got to actually just ease it out and i mean it's the same thing with all these revenge and one man army movies is like some of them are fun some of them are so bad they're good and others are just like yeah without that big name star really transforming the character it was otherwise pretty generic you know excuse for violence and it's just like yeah it i, I don't think really anyone knows what makes a great revenge movie now unless they do something that just really just Again, like like all these people we've talked about who can just really outline their segments and just really try and give it some kind of boost. <laughs> and you know, well, what do you got? I am have a little bit of a problem with, uh, you know, the purge and all these things about you know, you can murder anybody you want to one night of the year. Or this, you know. <laughs> And all this home invasion stuff. My God, it, it's been done now like a thousand times. You can only and, do straw dogs or panda rooms so many times. So yeah, and I don't understand. You know, and I'm after a while, I'm like, okay, what is what exactly is the thrill here? You know, here comes some guy in a pig mask, and he's gonna, you know, whatever. <laughs> Hit you on the head with a hammer. Well, it doesn't help that. Same thing with the spies is like everyone was trying to be born identity and take him for a while. And it's like, OK, so now what are you going to do when you bring a spy and assassin to the big screen? Because just I know Kung Fu, you know, that, that doesn't mean anything anymore. Now it's got to really be pretty interesting. You got to have some kind of extra quirk to that character that gives oh, us right. an idea. Of <laughs> yeah, like you need a compelling villain. And I think like for me, the thing is like you don't have to. I kind of have a problem with the the rise of like the anti-hero villain story like um because then one of, they just I think, did it to death through all the blockbusters well, and superhero stuff and it's well like, but also like i think that there's there's something to be said for having a villain where you come to understand them enough that you can kind of figure out why they think they're doing what they're doing but to me i want to not understand them too well i want them to still be able to be bad and the, the the example that is coming to my mind is when i was growing up i was completely obsessed with maleficent from sleeping Ooh. beauty i just thought she was the coolest character because she was literally called the mistress of all evil. I mean, that's badass, right? And like, mm -hmm. you know, as a little girl growing up in the 80s, I didn't get to see a whole lot of actual badass women in movies who were not just completely sexualized or infantilized, you know? Yeah. And she was she had a fucking castle that was scary <laughs> as hell. 
She had a whole army of minions that they were kind of silly, but I mean, they were scary. She had this cool crow or raven or whatever, and she turned into a goddamn dragon. I mean, that's so cool. And <laughs> I think that one of the things I liked about her is that there wasn't a whole backstory there. She was just bad. And she was right. awesome and, like, very attractive, which was probably when little Lindsay should have figured out that Lindsay wasn't straight. Because <laughs> when, when I started getting obsessed with this beautiful villain character at five years old. Um, but... I really appreciate the new movies that they've made about Maleficent. And I think Angelina Jolie does, is doing a wonderful job with the character. But I kind of don't want to know the backstory about why she became a bad guy. I kind of just want to let her be bad. And I um, think, like, there's a lot of that. Like, I, I kind of, I, I'm saying all of this because the point is, I want to know a little bit about why a villain is a villain. I want to know what's going on in their heads, but I don't want to then get so deep into their heads that I know them like a friend, because then I don't want to mm -hmm. see them do bad stuff. And I think that the thing with, um, like, like we were saying, you know, a guy in a dog mask, guy with a hammer, whatever, they're not actually that scary because you don't know what's driving them. It's just you don't like, even know who they are until they just take off a mask, and often that's when they do stunt casting, where they're just like, oh, right. hey, see, it's so-and-so. We didn't tell you that in the trailer. And I think that's just it. Because we've hired, a lot of studios have hired uh, all these companies that make trailers for a living, is like uh, half the time the filmmakers don't know what it's going to get advertised as. No, they're just too anxious, hoping they get a return, so then they get the freedom to do their next movie. And it's just mm -hmm. like... Yeah. I think we're we we've just so like you guys have said everything is just so over marketed, yeah. <laughs> and sometimes they will have a great villain backstory and a great villain actor cast. Uh, I can think of countless people who were brought to life by other character actors like Jeff Cover and Vincent D'Onofrio and mm -hmm. uh, Andrew Devoff, the Wishmaster, and is like yeah, is they, but. More often than not, some of these guys just get let down because, again, they'll just say, oh, well, now that we cast a bigger name as the hero, we need more screen time to them. The, all this right. other stuff that can go on the uh, cutting room floor. Or like Courtney was saying earlier, <laughs> it, just, it turns out that the actor who everyone loves is a jerk behind the screen, scenes and just sneaks <laughs> yeah. into the producer's lounge and says, hey, can you do me a favor and cut out this stuff? it's a better movie which means everyone else is gonna think it's a terrible movie <laughs> right yeah well yeah. you know what you're talking about one of the things we i mean i think it's such a great point about how too much knowledge of the bad guy and i was going to bring this up because i also like kind of passive characters who become badasses and this will sound really weird <laughs> but you know who is a badass Audrey Hepburn in Wait Until Dark. Ooh, yeah. deep dive. And Alan Arkin is so scary in that movie because <laughs> mm -hmm. he is so perverted. And she has that great line where she says, because she doesn't know, she doesn't know any of these guys. Of course, she can't see them either. Mm -hmm. But she says, it's different with him. It's like he wants to do evil things. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> and that's having, it. Having someone just say a, an atypical line that sums up just how bizarre this villain is, that's, yeah, that's a good way to go about it. And, uh, and then there she is. She's throwing gasoline on him and she's stabbing him and she's doing, yeah, you know, it's like, whoa. Wow. <laughs> I've got to see this movie. I've never seen it. That sounds really? Amazing. Okay. Okay. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. yeah. I'm putting it on my list right now. But you know, actually, interestingly, um, Alan Arkin, I was like, I know I know who he is, but I wanted to get a visual, so I just put him up uh, into IMDb real quick, and it reminded me that he plays pretty much the villain in Edward Scissorhands, which oh, yeah. I totally forgot that he was even in that movie. Right. You're um, so distracted by getting used to Depp bring the freakish character to life that you forget, oh yeah, these guys are... <laughs> Up right, there's other people in this movie. Him, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And what a like what a chilling role he played in that movie too. If I'm thinking maybe I'm thinking of the wrong Oh no, I'm thinking of no, the wrong thinking, character. Yeah. Hang on. Oh. Wait. 
I check all of these. It's been, a, it's been a minute since I've seen that one, but I know. Yeah, what... it's been a while. Now I'm I'm guessing I'm second guessing myself. Well, you know, I mean, because of he it began to play as he got older. So many benign grandfathers and Little Miss mm -hmm. Sunshine and that type of stuff. Right. And after these great comedies, you know, the in laws and everything else. I mean, he was absolutely brilliant. Dr. Dibble. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But after Wait Until Dark, he made such an astounding impression as a bad guy. He declared he would never do it again, ever. <laughs> because he said he could never top it. Huh. Top it and then have to, again, just get overcasted in it and yeah. i think he's used to doing so many other dark comedies it's like it's better yeah, to do and, it he's so one, and oh my god argo and all that i mean you know he's tremendous the kaminsky method i just love it and uh but here was this one performance that is so absolutely terrifying hmm. right and you know good lord and audrey hepburn blind kicks his ass that's awesome yeah. I really, uh, I think that that's something that, like, you know, talking about a female lead who is kicking ass and who's a badass. Um, there's, there's something that annoys me so much about the new trend for having, you know, strong female character, all in quotes, um, who just kicks ass all the time, and that's like her primary character trait, you know. And yeah, I, I, it's like they get writers who. Is like they don't know how to write for the other genders. Like you see that all the time. The last black writers, you you write the black characters. Women, you write the female characters. And it's like, well, now you're pigeonholing your writers. Just everyone have an update and then just pass each other notes saying, would you think someone would do this in this situation? Just honest opinion. And it, it like you say, is like it, they seem to just want to pigeonhole. They they'll try and be groundbreaking, but yeah, they'll either over sexualize the characters or they'll say look i'm a bad uh, i'm a badass male or a female i'm a badass female kicking ass and it's just like there there should be something more to this yeah right? you're like, not giving us anything else to go on <laughs> yeah yeah and actually this is this is gonna maybe come out of left field but i've been just thinking about this i think that a real badass and villain character that does not get enough credit is Lena Headey's character Cersei Lannister in Game of Thrones? <laughs> I love to hate her. She, she was right. <laughs> she's everyone loves to hate her, um, and yet, like the, we do get a few moments of like, oh, I think I kind of see where she's coming from here, and then you just go back to hating her. But um, I thought that that the way that the character was handled, there are a lot of things that I could tear apart game of thrones for there are a lot of things i didn't like <laughs> oh, about game many. of thrones but her character was you know absolutely cold-hearted ruthless bitter violent just mean just the worst and they started out by over sexualizing her very early on in the show but after that she really just blew it out of the park like i thought that her I thought ability she was deeper than the script she knew where the yeah. character was going to likely go and i mean i think she's as close as the show got to feeling like hbo's earlier show rome oh good point yeah that was a great I'm still waiting on that movie <laughs> <laughs> that would be nice uh, yeah and talk about some strong female characters who didn't have to kick ass all the time like I really like that in both Rome and Game of Thrones where, yeah, you had, you know, some female fighter characters and that was totally cool, but you had all of these other female characters who were not fighters and yet who ended up ruling the entire show because they were just ruthless and unwilling to accept being treated as lesser than because mm -hmm. they were women. And that's just like, I, I really appreciated it. And I will never say that I like Cersei Lannister, but, <laughs> but I could really appreciate what Lena Headey was doing with the role. And just the fact that there was a character like that on TV for eight seasons. Like, you know, it's not often that you get to see a woman really be that bad for that long without coming to a gruesome end much earlier <laughs> pretty much and then it even seemed like that was how every other show had to be is like somebody has to have like a supernatural entity to them you saw it with some of those other syndicated shows like kung fu witchblade highlander and it's just like okay 
but now some of the suspense is gone because we know that at the end of the day they're going to be if anything they're going to be saved by visual effects or plot and new stupidity it's like okay and <laughs> the character dies because oh whoop de doo the villain was a, a slob and he tripped on his own sword and oh, oh, oh oops well <laughs> Well, I know, but but just I have to interject because I have the 300 Rise of the Empire on kind of a constant loop in my living. <laughs> I, I no, I mean, look, I I would just live and die just to see Eva Green every day. That's just, <laughs> and she is so awesome in that when she She's cuts awesome off that guy's head and then kisses him, it is just. What great <laughs> Dude, of all when time. I saw her in Casino Royal. I was like, hey, now they're respecting Bond girls. Now they can have a complicated past. And then they just totally forgot that after that movie, uh, that oh. in Quantum. And it was just like, okay, so oh, now. I, you... I love her in Casino. Oh my gosh. I, 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 you know, I'm, I'm, I'm all about Daniel Craig. I love Skyfall. I thought it was tremendous. Uh, I'm, I'm hit and miss on uh, Bond now because this is kind of where. It happens with all the eras, but yeah, after a while, after like the third or fifth, fourth installment, basically, Bond has to start emulating other franchises that are out at the time. Like you got, you know, well, that, that's what happened with Roger Moore and everything. Yeah, yeah, Star Wars and it's just like, you know, little, guys, be Bond. Oh, Stop trying to be like everybody else. <laughs> but but no, one thing I wanted to 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 bring up is we're kind of skipping over one of the the main like villains who are also badasses that has almost completely disappeared from movies and that's it really has no femme fatales mm -hmm. yeah yeah and and all well, that and or the it, villain just has to be just ruthless like they have to give a rousing speech and it just seemed like post gladiator <laughs> matrix even lord of the rings is just like after a while, you just saw just, again, just actors playing to the camera versus becoming the character. And it's just like, okay, it works for some movies and other movies. It's just a really bad soap opera. <laughs> I, I mean, let me ask you. I mean, come on. get Let's get real. Is there anyone who is more bad news than Kathleen Turner and Body Heat? <laughs> <laughs> William Hurd, how could you be so stupid? <laughs> I know. It's with her. You know, it's just like, oh, my God. That is, she is. Woo. But yeah, yeah, noir is always a good stopping point. And unfortunately, it seems like that's another one I wish people would try and get more right. Everyone just seems to think, oh, I got to have the characters of Private Eye and there's this jazz music playing and there's right. fancy yeah. lighting. It's <laughs> like, no, noir. The best kind of noir is where you actually use the lights and the actor to tell a complicated and rather complex story. And we, the we, the audience, get a jackhammer and try and, you know, get through the concrete and tear apart the insides of this weird mystery and <laughs> character study. But, yeah. Well, you know, when you pull apart, say, uh, of course, the ultimate example everyone always uses for everything is Chinatown. And there, the wonderful thing that, that uh, Town did was that uh, Faye Dunaway is the victim. She is yeah. not drawing... Yeah. Jake Geddes into a web. Yeah, she's a victim of incest and everything, and Jack Houston, he perfectly portrays, you know, well-known director, perfectly portrays, again, just ruthless businessmen who, who and, they, and that's not just one of his many victims. He has dozens who will that's become right. victims for now because he's part of a company that poisons, you know, the water in California. So it's just like, yeah, the best well, villains are the ones. Spoilers, dude. Oh shit! Well, okay, but uh, 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 ugly. What is it? Ugly buildings, whores, and politicians all get respectable if they live long enough. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, the best films are which not no jail time or fooling them full of lead will be enough justice. <laughs> it's like they've yeah. done so much damage, you are beating a dead horse by that point. To just uh, and those are basically today's real life villains. It's like. You can ask for a trial of anybody who you've heard a scandal about and you're either not going to get it or they're just going to have lawyers who stall. And it's just like, that's just it. The, we see villains every day and out, whether it's in the form of your boss or a worker who's making your life hell or just any other person. I'm sure you've had villains on your movie set, so you're like, man, you're making my life you know, 
so well, hard. I think, yeah, I've encountered that once or twice. Well, there you go. And it is like, well, thank God everything else was great because that was not that was a pretty dark chapter to go through. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so you brought up Kathleen Turner, and I'm gonna do one of these again where I'm like making connections, but this this one might be an interesting rabbit hole to go down. And that's a pun, because Kathleen Turner also did the voice of Jessica Rabbit. And I think <laughs> she's really an interesting character because it's it's the same kind of like Rothadope where you see this character on the screen and you think, oh, she's clearly a femme fatale. And then yeah. that iconic line of, I'm not bad, I'm just drawn that way, is actually <laughs> true. Like, she's actually a real sweetheart and she only ever has Roger's, you know, best interest at heart and is very sweet. Um, but I've right. always kind of thought that Cruella de Vil was is kind of like if Jessica Rabbit aged really badly and got really bitter. <laughs> like, oh, totally. Yeah. Uh, I saw a live <laughs> stage play in my town one time by a popular theater company, and they did a Dalmatian takedown. I was like, you know, Cruella de Vil can actually be a pretty uh, – is definitely probably the more ruthless of the Disney villains because, I mean, the rest of them were always, you know, again, lions or tigers or bears, you know, <laughs> just doing a turf <laughs> war. You know, it's the same thing as cops and robbers – or cowboys and Indians in, again, cartoon form and just awesome characterization. But it's like, yeah, it's like, well, DeVille is basically someone who, uh, you know, thinks that she's just a nice, you know, humble queen equivalent, you know, but who owns a corporation that makes, you know, stuff from dead animals. So it's just like, yeah, it's like, that's yeah, a perfect awesome. summary. Yeah, and, perfect and I always really like that about her that she has this very femme fatale sort of energy. She's got a to giant her. cigarette. It's not a Cuban she's got a giant cigarette. cigarette. She's got that huge car. <laughs> she's got these giant fur coats, and you can tell that she thinks she's bad news. Just I mean, like even Kathleen the black and Turner, white hair you know? was that she thinks she's in the gray. <laughs> <Literally>. <laughs> And like, and, yeah. she's got all, and she's got all those henchmen to do her bidding for. Her. Yeah, who are uh, the Tim, the the henchmen she hires are almost always like the equivalent of Boris and Natasha. They're just too busy yeah. arguing with each other. To right. Get... Well, I mean, you know, it's a Disney movie. You got to keep it light. Like, but, but I really, <laughs> I do think that especially like seventies up through like mid nineties era, and actually before that, let's say like fifties up through mid nineties era Disney films it. really got villainesses right like they're they they were almost always comical in some way and it was you know kids movies so they were sort of two-dimensional but i really felt like in a lot of those movies disney villainesses were able to be powerful women that had really interesting characters like they were they were compelling you wanted to know more about them um and you kind of rooted for some of them as an adult watching those movies like I, I had a much younger sibling born when I was already a teenager. So I, I rewatched a lot of Disney movies later in life. <laughs> and I found you myself. Watch around kids. Yeah. yeah, you know, I, I watched Snow White, Sleeping Beauty, 101 Dalmatians, you know, all of these on repeat with my little sister. And I really got an appreciation for the fact that, like, yes, these characters might have been the villains. They might have been a little two dimensional, but they were interesting. And you really didn't. Right see a whole lot of really badass female characters like that. I didn't that. even get that from the live action Disney remakes half the time. I mean, same yeah. for Epicent, <laughs> like you mentioned. It's like because it's like it made sense. Uh, Angelina Jolie had already played complex characters in those serial killer movies she did, as well as Evelyn Saltz, you know, is she really good or is she just bad? Or it's like at the end she's basically an anti hero. She's like yeah. she's gonna kill anyone who gets in her way to take down the Russian terror cell. And at the same time, she can't live in the States because she never was a civilian there to begin with. She was planted there by the Russians and then learned, oh, I shouldn't work for them, but I should pretend to work for them. <laughs> and it's like oh. spies and all these other and even cowboys never have a happy ending because they don't even <laughs> have a happy existence. And so, yeah, to see all these princesses who realize I should be more than just a damsel in distress, to see a prince who has to learn to do more than just think with their dick, let alone their sword, is <laughs> like and become the <laughs> badass who defeats the dragon or whatever. Is like, yeah, to have these Disney villains who do all this scheming, orchestrate all these unstoppable armies and incompetent henchmen is like you really could see how 
they transform because it would be the equivalent of, oh, you know, I we were part of the same family and mother and father loved you better. <laughs> yeah, you know what I always wondered about is Ursula in uh, The Little Mermaid because th that's one that my little sister watched a lot. So <laughs> I have quite a lot of knowledge about The Little Mermaid swimming around in my head. But I'm pretty sure that the only reason that Ursula goes after Ariel is because she's trying to get back at Ariel's dad, King Triton, for something. But they never say what it is. They never come out with it. And I personally think that Ursula and King Triton had a romance that went south. I kind of got that too. Like, yeah? Oh, and that's my why God. they had the rival kingdoms. Like, is like, hey, we don't go to that part of the sea. <laughs> right? Yeah. Like, what are and you hiding? Even look Triton? at how their tridents are drawn. Is like, isn't hers kind of just more just nefarious and his is more just like silver, but kind of bland? <laughs> yeah. He's, he's totally privileged. the bland dad type who's trying to <laughs> protect his daughter by not telling her things that she should know. And and that's why Your everything happens in the first place. So crusty all down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I always I just thought that like Ursula is so interesting because like, you know, not only is she bad and scary and all that, and she has this, you know, she has this deep voice. She clearly has smoked her entire life. I don't know how that works underwater. You know, like she's got tentacles and she's like she's a big girl, right? And you don't think like, but she's still kind of sexy. And like the the messaging there was just so mind-blowing to me when I was a kid. I was like, I don't know how I feel about this character. Clearly she's bad, but I'm so interested. And I really feel like Disney was very good at doing that with their villains, and particularly their villainesses. And it's like, you know, these, these characters get to be badasses primarily because most of them are single, older women. Like, they're no longer right. considered conventionally attractive. They don't have a husband telling them what to do. And they're rich. And we are just repeating so much history when we've just seen all these arguments that have come out. And it's just like, really, there, there are still just so many idiots on the planet who just think that if someone who has to be beautiful for them to just like, you know, listen to their opinion or everything is like, uh, or you can just be an average everyday kind of person. You know, it's just like <laughs> if I have to have just above average supernatural qualities for me to matter then I don't want to matter to begin with. You know, it's just like, <laughs> it just, and it is kind of true how it's just like, those are the best villains. It's like, they want to pick on the ones who had what they once had and they no longer have, which includes everything, money, power, beauty. <laughs> yeah, yeah family, but yeah. also I think it's like, I don't know, I think it's kind of empowering that like these like, these older women, right? They actually have real power because they're rich and they're old and they don't give a fuck anymore. <laughs> and most of the time, the person that they're going after is this, you know, helpless little girl who we're invested in because she's pretty and young. And it's like, right. and I mean, it's fucked up. About don't go after side. pretty young women. But like, yep. if I and, and love that they it. have the power and the ability to do that because they're not following the script of like what you're supposed to be like oh, as totally. a woman. They, uh, that that's as uh, and that's as deep as those conventions got. Because yeah, I mean. Uh, you had it even just with other stuff where it's, it's like, take apart uh, whichever animal is finding which or whichever, like you say, uh, uh, rich person preying on the, you know, orphan of the, right, yeah. <laughs> the dead mother or father. It, it, it really does get to be very interesting how it's like halfway through the movies do take a twist, but most people, they don't remember that because they just remember, oh, good animated. I put it on all the time for the kids. I'm like, well, <laughs> uh, <laughs> the reason they're so good in English lit and all these other things is because they were actually paying attention to the movie. They weren't paying attention to, you know, just the shocking stuff everyone <laughs> talked about. Or Are the you calling of... me a nerd? I think he's calling me a nerd. <laughs> oh, I'm a geek. I'm, I'm, I'm just saying, in general, like, I would see it all the time. I would be in a random literature or philosophy class, and someone would bring up, oh, yeah, like, with uh, Trinity and Morpheus in the Matrix. It's like, exactly. You know, the people would use metaphors all the time. They do pop culture. Sometimes they get even more wacky and off-color, just mentioning yeah. characters who are idiots on certain sitcoms. It's like, Yes, that's a perfect example of. Yeah. Well, and to, <laughs> and to like veer off of my feminist rant about Disney villainesses, <laughs> which I could I could go, I could do this all day. Um, another Disney villain that comes to mind that I think is worth mentioning 
is Scar in The Lion King, who yes. is badass <laughs> because Jeremy Irons, and can we just talk about Jeremy Irons, please? <laughs> <laughs> Simon Groover, there you go. Yeah, no, very true. Because, I mean, can you think of any other Disney character who bursts into song? I know there is, but can you really? <laughs> I mean, yeah, but I, as we know, I'm a Disney nerd, so. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but this is like, uh, I, I think that's why this character has kind of gone beyond even the Disney crowd. I'll, I will see, like, someone share a meme or something when, <laughs> especially when people are picking a trolling war, someone will be like, oh, we got Scar from the Lion King has invaded. You know, just, <laughs> and it is kind of funny how it's like, yeah, he kind he kind of did have a rich dickhead brother who happened to be king and he <laughs> and where he was in the wrong is it led to murder but it's like yeah, it yeah is kind and of we fun. never really find out what happened between those two characters leaves it to the viewer to dis uh, dis yeah. discern is like and of course it takes you a while to realize it's like yeah simba he he kind of the fight is won and over and done with but you know, he didn't become a badass overnight. <laughs> he didn't even really even have to be a badass to begin with. He just had to basically just discover the truth and yeah. let out suffering on the person who had inflicted all this year-long pain on him. But it does get to be interesting how, I guess you could say, uh, I mean, just having all these various, you know, African beasts, you know, just the hyenas, the lions, the tigers, and, it's just minotaurs is like those are perfect symbols of just again people who are standoffish who uh, are very overprotective of what everything they they cherish and hold sacred so yeah i mean it, i think that that is definitely the reason one of those that character and even just that movie in general are just always going to be just very just bigger than life for so many people and I really, it really was a fantastic movie. <laughs> I'm just saying it. I oh, totally. And I, I think everybody just nowadays. I mean, I'm kind of like Courtney, where I would just remember the villain of the week on a crime or a sci-fi show, and you're you're doing a good job too, Lindsay, of just outlining just the ones who the villain made the movie because yeah. it's like uh, everything else. It's not that it played it safe, but it was kind of typical of what we expected. But getting yeah. there was so abnormal to what we were used to. And I think that's just it, too. It's just like either half the time now, it just seems like investors have just I mean, don't get me wrong. They totally have taken over Hollywood. But nowadays, again, I'm just seeing too much stunt casting. And that's all that's in the trailer. Even it's like so and so and so and so fight each other on screen. <laughs> Who will win? And this is like. I, it can't be just the dick measuring cut. It's got to be something more than that. It really has to be, but do I actually care? You know, otherwise it's just a forum war that went on too long. And I stopped looking at the comments after a while because they stopped being funny. You know, it should actually be a pretty cool, just not even necessarily even a fight, but just an interesting, why does the villain want certain destruction? And why does the, hero or even anti-hero in some respects who's actually ironed and not just oh we got to have him be an anti-hero by default because that's what everyone else is doing it's like why why do they want to even cross paths why do they want to have each other in each other's crosshairs yeah. and why do they even want to i, I really and scar is kind of the villain he doesn't show it but he did come off to me even just with how he was holding his brother over the edge of the cliff it's like he is the kind of guy who would actually want to see someone get eaten alive while he tossed them across. <laughs> you know, he is that kind of guy. And so it totally. is kind of funny how I, I guess that's where Disney villains started getting more playful. And I think that's why he's held out as long as he has in pop True. culture. True. Well, and, and I mean, uh, again, Jeremy Irons, the voice of Scar, he's just the creepiest dude like he really knew how to add the extra gruffness to it without just kind of becoming monotone, and that was really good on his part as a voice actor. But yeah, yeah I, mean, I mean, I think a lot of these theater actors have also just embraced is like you got to be able to transform through every role, and sometimes just the simplest prep is what really does make the movie. And uh, I think also what you guys also mentioned earlier is just so many of these actors, the reason they came this far and made all these memorable 
badasses is because not only did we not expect it, but they were able to do it all along and we're just now seeing it. So now that's why we're looking at it and it's even more rewarding as a fan of their works. And yeah, <laughs> uh, I could mention maybe a few more, but uh, I mean, <laughs> man, you guys have mentioned just some of the best ones and perfectly outlined them again. <laughs> yes. High fives all around. High five. <laughs> uh oh shoot um how about the candy man <laughs> oh I, I am not familiar okay Tony, courtney are you familiar with tony todd <laughs> uh intimately hmm. and uh <laughs> I mean, I don't know, you know, that 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 franchise now that it's been rebooted again and, you know, all that stuff. So I don't know. I like Tony Todd. He's a you know, I, I, he's got a lot of presence and a lot of power as an actor. Well, let's, let's let's just stick with the first one yeah, or in parts of the second one, because basically, I mean, who would have known that this guy who's just, again, basically stalks this helpless woman. And I don't want to say helpless. That's not the right term. This. Uh, this reporter who's trying to uncover the truth and uh, to see again, just how that was just so Gothic in its nature and even just perfectly outlined how, you know, the villain, you know, is from the 1800s and is basically the reincarnated spirit in another form of a, you know, a man who was just picked on as a slave and just, you know, totally wronged as a person. And, stung to death in the field with bees and how he inflicts some of these same torturous devices on people, much like Pinhead and Hellraiser, you know, mm -hmm. and just to see him just kind of go around and just kind of one minute be very intimate and the next minute be just very terrifying. It's like to where it's like, oh man, there's no way anyone's going to leave this room alive. And how it really did kind of just show how you could go back I'd, I would probably tie him there with Norman Bates in the original Psycho, just because you you understood why he was wronged, and you could even each time you watched it, you got something different from it each time. It's like that's that that was pretty good, and they just did the simplest things that you could do to make it be better. Just the Philip Glass's music score, uh, Bernard Rose not being just a director, but also supervising the art direction and. Uh, the place where it was filmed, you know, just, uh, just have it be in a lot of those, uh, 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 rundown project areas, uh, places like Chicago and Louisiana and what have you. And just like, yeah, this, these perfectly sum up just again, just how, how this man stocks all kinds of victims because, uh, the abuse is felt there anywhere and he clings on to it because he was a victim of that. And that's, it's the line be my victim. <laughs> well, you know, and particularly when you get into the Louisiana stuff, I mean, that's just pure Southern Gothic. So you're immediately transformed back 200 years anyway, just visually. And, you know, they, yeah. took, uh, you know, tremendous advantage of that. And so yeah, the editing yeah. and the score tell the story and it's not just about the bloodshed, you know? <laughs> right. Exactly. And, um, but, you know, as they readdressing, uh, these horror flicks, I don't know. Sometimes it works. I think most times it doesn't. Oh, it doesn't for sure. Nowadays, you, everybody's you very clinging on to just, Let's have stoner s visions and let's just do another dress up of the, about the billionth, you know, killer roommate or boyfriend oh, sure. or girlfriend from hell. And it's just yeah. like, at the end of the day, it's the same goofy slashers we grew up in the 80s and we either laughed at, but not because it, for the right reasons. You know, it's just it's like, guys, well, we got to grow up eventually. <laughs> there's, there's alcohol. It's what the thing that, you know, a lot of folks don't understand. And I'm not anti remake at all. But there is alchemy that exists when you make a movie. Oh, totally. And it either all comes together or it doesn't. But there's no rhyme or reason. And, you know, the most prepared thing in the world can turn into a disaster. And something that's kind of winged a little bit and, 
people are, you know, they kind of don't know what's coming next. Uh, like when when Hooper did Texas Chainsaw Massacre and what have oh, you. And God. <laughs> you find, yeah. you know, something just absolutely tremendous. And uh, when you boil it down and you look at, say, those seminal horror movies that came out of the 60s and the 70s, and they've been examined to death. Uh, oh, totally. But, and, you uh, know, all the Brazilian other ones with a lowbrow title. <laughs> sure, but that's the thing. I mean, George Romero and those guys, they didn't know what the hell they were doing with Night of the Living Dead. They had no clue that it would become what it became. They I were think just they knew what they wanted that. to make, but they definitely never predicted, yeah, we're going to no, get a never. criteria. And they, were just, they <laughs> were just following their instincts in the best ways that they could. And it was always forging into something that was completely unknown. You know, Texas but Chainsaw was, those guys were still film students, half of them. Right. <laughs> and people and, had worked on other schlocky stuff, and this happened to be one that was less schlocky and more just chill, chill, know, chill, and they're, chill. And they're shooting, you know, in 100-degree heat, and they're uncomfortable, and they're mm-hmm. getting sick because of the real bones hanging around on the sets. Getting and everything. ripped off by yeah. mafia producers. <laughs> and Yeah, I mean, well, yeah, all that's that a good... Stuff. I mean, and, Romero, he was able to get through because he was already used to just, he knew critics were going to hate everything he made, but he knew people at the drive-ins would love it. And at the same time, he basically had a problem with everything about society post-Vietnam. So at that <laughs> point, he was just like, everything I hate, I'm going to ha- have those guys be the villains. And everything I can see, anyone I can see being a hero is like, yeah, this person's going to survive. That person's not going to survive because they're full right. of themselves. <laughs> well, you know, that's kind of what... It's funny when I go on Facebook because I was a I was a zombie in Dawn of the Dead. <laughs> oh really? I, oh that's oh, right. Yeah. I do Absolutely. remember that in one of the making of novels. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And uh, whenever that that still of me gets posted, I get more hits on my Facebook than anything else. Is that picture of all of us up against the glass of uh, the J.C. Penney's? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The the uh, yes the sixteen year old zombie. <laughs> <laughs> hey, awesome. embrace it, man. Embrace yeah. it. You were one of the best villains of all time. <laughs> yeah, why aren't you on this list? <laughs> and you were part of a collective. You were like the Borg. <laughs> Speaking of which, the Borg, pretty oh, yes. good, pretty the good Borg villainy queen. right there. Although I never, I never got on board with the Borg queen. I just thought she was, like, I get that they needed to give the Borg a face so that she could be, you know, personified and be seen as a singular villain. But I really thought, like, they didn't need to do that and the Borg would have been scarier. It worked for me in a Hellraiser way, but I know what you mean. Like, even if just the guest villains of the week who happened to be that, they were pretty much, again, their mission doesn't add up. But as you come to kind of see them, you could kind of see how ruthless they were without realizing how ruthless they were. It's like in their minds, it's like we are it's not even based on what I want to do and everything because, you know, they're cyborgs now. So at that point, it's just we we are just the superior race because we don't feel anything. We do everything. We help each other build other giant you know, robotic yeah. collectives. So it's like when you just got someone who is. I mean, part of it was kind of a problem of just the writers doing it to death and then the other times of not knowing what to do with it. But the other the the we remember more of the good than the less lesser moments. And it's like, yeah, yeah, to have those guys just be just again, they're kind of like the killer cyborgs in Blade Runner, where it's just like Mm. from this point on that they don't want to just feel they also want to be kind of free of any responsibility or any devoid Mm. of any issues that you would have if you were in a human capacity. <laughs> right, yeah. And that's why they're so effective. You know, they're not stopped by all that. And actually, you know, the yeah, more yeah. I think about the Borg Queen, the more actually I find that there's a lot to explore there. Because, like, I think they needed, like I said, to give the Borg a face because they needed someone that Jean-Luc Picard could go up against. And I'm pretty sure that's probably where the the idea for the character came from. But... right. It's kind of brilliant because the whole idea that the Borg are this hive mind and they act based on what the collective wants is completely the opposite of them having a queen who actually tells them what to do. So she's actually a huge hypocrite. 
Oh, totally. And that's what, that's also what I desire from any movie. And they're in, they're in good movies and there's also in good movies, but it's like, yeah, it's like those villains and even the best zombie movies, I always got these kinds of personas and ideas from these characters. And as we've all talked about before, the guys who have various henchmen who work for them, who were very just as well, had just as much effective screen time as the main antagonist. Those were great. But yeah, it's like I never they had what I never got from the endless droid or stormtrooper armies that George Lucas conjured up. And it's just like, yeah, these guys actually i can get an idea of how they feel just by seeing how they act and walk around and <laughs> stare at us like who is this you know eliminate you know, <laughs> convert we, so we've we've mentioned like bumbling henchmen a few times and something just occurred to me that i've never thought about before but i think <laughs> so like okay i'm going back to disney just because it's like the easiest uh <laughs> it really is but, yeah because everything comes back to disney okay um, but, but, you know, like, if we're talking about one of the Disney villains Disney that has these, the like, ridiculous, ridiculous <laughs> bundling henchmen, they can't get anything right, and it's so, like, that used to annoy me a lot, actually, about Maleficent. Like, why would she have these stupid henchmen if she's so cool? But if you think about the, the psychology of a lot of these, like, big deal villains who are huge narcissists, they couldn't have people around who would actually be intelligent and good at their jobs because then they might get good enough at their job to take over right. and like stage a coup. Too so you, of course you have to, to have idiots. <laughs> right. Just, this is all making sense to me now. <laughs> my, my, my like now wall. Take over everything. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah true. Actually they know what they're doing. They've been studying their villains all along. <laughs> Uh, I'm wondering if Apple or Microsoft will try and take over a few movie industries. <laughs> <laughs> well, Apple TV is happening. Amazon already has Amazon Prime. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, we, yeah. we just couldn't. We have tried to go an episode without Bezos, and there we are. Right. So Bezos, you are an interesting <laughs> villain. <laughs> Speaking of super villains, <laughs> Jeff Bezos. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Lex Luthor. <laughs> <laughs> yep. He's got, like, if, if Lex Luthor and. Uh, Dr. Evil from the Austin Powers. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Dr. Evil Had a baby. got in on the joke. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. But he married my favorite at Los Angeles weather girl. Huh? Oh, really? I Jeff didn't hear Diesel. the beginning of that. Or I should say favorite Los Angeles news anchor. There's a evil Los Angeles news anchor. <laughs> No, Jeff Bezos is getting ready to marry her. Oh, that's right. Oh, oh. shit. <laughs> a minute. Yeah. <laughs> I did not know that. Interesting. Oh, oh yeah, off. absolutely. Still happening. All right. Oh, uh, <laughs> do I sense an Amazon news channel coming? I think I do. <laughs> Dear. Oh, man. <laughs> oh. <laughs> man. Where, are we just predicting the future now? <laughs> it's too yeah. Uh, thank you all for being on here. This was just a fun <laughs> escapade into everything, everything right with all the wrongdoers in cinema and TV. So thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks you for having us. Like, this oh, was fun. Yeah. <laughs> uh, any other promotions before we take off? Or <laughs> uh, my website is lindsayg.com. Visit my website. <laughs> yeah. And Courtney, anything? <laughs> well, um, on the uh, commentary front, the um, You're North doing Dons, Yeah, but, well, I'm now I've 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 now I don't know what this means uh, except maybe the the uh, battlements of a wasted life, but I'm, I've now passed 175 of these things. <laughs> So I'm inescapable. <laughs> but uh, this month, October, I have uh, High Sierra and the Incredible Shrinking Man coming out from uh, Criterion. Oh, you're uh, doing the commentary tracks for those, man. Yeah, yeah that's what I'm saying. Yeah, 100 and over 150 of these things now. Yeah. Um, daughter of Frank, Frankenstein's daughter and uh, Amazing Mr. X from uh, Film Detective, The Hell Fighters from... Uh, um, indicator 
and also uh, the return of Sabata with uh, Lee Van Cleef. Uh, that is from uh, Eureka. And we just had uh, Skullduggery from Kino. I did that with uh, Sergio Mims and Howard Berger. So that's very good. I've got a new book coming out, uh, The Perspectives on Elmore Leonard, or last I wrote a chapter for it, that Andrew Rausch uh, uh, went ahead and he edited that. And, you know, we optioned that sequel I wrote to 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. That got bought again, and hopefully sure, maybe yeah. it happened with it this time. And, and um, you know, and I'm still writing the shotgun westerns for Double Day. So there you go, you know, trying to stay yeah. out of jail. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> By writing about people who have escaped from jail and became cowboys. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Oh, man. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. That's very impressive. So, well, I don't know. <laughs> impressive or it just is a measure of how many birthdays I've survived. <laughs> hey, man. I'm happy for both of you guys because. We need to be able to keep doing what we'd like to do and that what keeps us going creatively as people. So, yeah, you know, that's some very well, inspiring well, stuff. Well, let's we have to leave this with an absolute swearing promise that you are going to watch. Wait until dark. I absolutely will. I literally wrote it down <laughs> on a piece of paper. I've already seen it, I swear. <laughs> yeah. Good, <laughs> okay. Okay. It's, I, it's I officially at the top of my list now. In fact, for a while, I would even joke to my dad if we saw a Homeland Invasion trailer on or if there was a moment where someone was invading a home and I was like, and wait until dark on free. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, I have so many stupid recurring jokes. It's ridiculous. <laughs> uh, my my <laughs> you were talking about Bronson earlier. My, my pals Tony and Cloys always repeat the Simpsons gag. I'm going to kill Emmett. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that he's a part of. Uh, uh, whenever my brother asked me about a Planet Hollywood movie, uh, I was always uh, the follow up question would be, uh, uh, I would always confirm for him if it was fun or not. I was like, oh yeah, he killed a guy. <laughs> <laughs> I killed a bunch actually. <laughs> oh yeah, no, that that's great. I'm. Uh, Lindsay, please keep sharing your website and your other just uh, uh, stuff that you're documenting. And uh, yeah, Courtney, uh, keep documenting the factoids you know about these gyms. <laughs> yeah, it, it actually just occurred to me that if if I were being good at this, I should probably plug the comic book that I'm writing. <laughs> um, it's Ooh. it's a, a long series. It's eventually going to be collected as like you know whole graphic novel. But um, interestingly, the main character is one of those. Like, I wouldn't call her an anti-hero. I would still call her a hero, but she's deeply, deeply flawed. And depending on where you're sitting and what your belief system is, she could very well be a villain. She's got, she's sort of a megalomaniac. Um, and because, you know, it's a ridiculous, like, kind of junk science sci-fi graphic novel, she literally creates, like, a race of cyborg clones Ooh, okay. to protect her. And she's also very much a femme fatale. She's been trained as a sort of an enforcer for a crime syndicate. So when we meet her, she's very much a femme fatale, like very deadly, you know, has and has all of these feminine wiles that are like borderline superpowers. She can kind of it's talk anyone into typical anything. Of what um, we expect. <laughs> but she exits a life of crime to become a porn star. Um, <laughs> awesome. And her, she, she loves her new life, you know, she chooses pleasure over pain and violence, but her <laughs> past won't leave her alone. And so she feels that she needs to protect herself. So she makes this entire army <laughs> of well, cyborg clones. Just for protection, everybody. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's just for protection. Um, <laughs> we kind of leave that, we kind of use, leave all of the uses for her soldiers a little ambiguous. Um, but uh, oh, nice. I, I realize her name is Tracy Queen. Um, there are two issues of the book out now. We're working on the third. Um, and it, I think it's a really good story. <laughs> so, and I think that she's an interesting, like, kind of a villain, kind of not a villain at the same time. But, you know, going back to our mention of bad news, femme fatales, she's definitely bad news. So just, just going <laughs> to plug that right there. You can look me up or look up TracyQueen.com and find out all the info. Oh, cool. Great. She is a queen. Very cool, guys. Yeah, please, please. I'll be on the lookout for your Facebook 
and Twitter timelines. But yeah, please keep staring, sharing those. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Thanks for letting me plug it. <laughs> All means. Okay. Well, and in the meantime, everybody just keep doing other stuff that just puts a smile on your face. It's like, no. Get through this. <laughs> Let's get Thank you all so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. What fun. Too much fun. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you all for making it. Once again. Hey, if you ever want to do an all Disney all the time episode, you know who to call, right? <laughs> Perfect. Let's do the top di 10 Disney films. <laughs> yes. Oh, they man. sold out. Let's do the ones where it's like that makes up the company even walt disney didn't know what he was making was so good <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah i could i could go on and on perfect nice. you guys rock the cash bar <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was great to meet you courtney thanks so much oh, no this was great fun thank you if you do your disney top 10 you are going to include Twenty Thousand leagues aren't you Ooh. oh good yeah. point. <laughs> Well, now, obviously, yes. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> Kirk Douglas singing to a seal. You know, you've got to. <laughs> yeah, it might not get better than that. That's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm going to have to rewatch that one. That's for sure. Oh, I'll put that on my list right under Wait Until Dark. <laughs> okay, great. See, there's a double feature. It's wonderful. Double feature. <laughs> No, I'll tell you, no, something else, when you watch Wait Until Dark, it, you will really notice, and it was genre changing, and it never gets the credit it should. I've talked to Mike Schlesinger and all these guys about it, and they actually agree, and they like, I don't know why. Henry Mancini's score is so unbelievable, and there is a moment in this movie with a sting, and you know exactly the moment I'm talking about, is literally set the pattern for thriller and horror movie scores from that movie onward. Every oh. single score owes something to what Mancini created for that film. Oh, awesome. I love Henry Mancini. I mean, how could you not? Yeah. Wow, oh, cool. I will definitely, definitely watch that as soon as I can. Okay, good. <laughs> Thanks for the recommendation. You bet. Uh, I'm sure we could all share each other's letter boxes and we would have a fun oh, time. Oh, sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right, folks. Well, I'm going to peace out. I'm going to have some dinner. That sounds Alrighty. like the perfect plan. I think I might do That's the same thing. Great idea. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget to eat, folks. No. All right. No, well, no. Thanks again. Okay. You guys. Two Bye. Stars. Bye. <laughs> We'll return after these messages. Hey, feeling down? Feeling low? Not enough podcasts about movies in your life? Why not try? They must be destroyed on sight! The new Podcast Cure All. Sure to get you right with the world and on a path to better living. We have exploitation, we have Italian horror, we have zombies, we have slashers, we have crime films, we have spaghetti westerns, we even have sci-fi and sex comedies. So take a dose of... They must be destroyed on sight! As needed, and let the hosts, Lee Russell, Daniel Harper, Paul Romali, and the odd guest host, cure what ails you. Warning, may cause atrophy, African consumption, black fever, bone shave, chin puff, call it, cramp call it. Dropsy of the brain, elephantitis, grocer's itch, jaundice, mania, miasma, mortification, palsy, pox disease, rheumatism, scurvy, St. Anthony's fire, summer complaint, and worm fit in some people. Consult a physician before listening. Hey, I heard you like movies. I heard you like to hustle. I heard you like podcasts. Well, guess what? There's a podcast for you out there called The Home Video Hustle. Damn right. Every Friday, we talk about whatever movie PJ picks out the bag. What does that mean? Every Wednesday on our YouTube page, I put a bunch of movies in a bag, and PJ picks one out at random. And then we just watch it. We talk about it for maybe like an hour, hour and a half, two hours. Whatever we feel like doing, wherever the conversation leads us. But do we actually talk about the movie? 
most of the time. Ah. Tangents galore. Yes. So believe me, we may be a movie podcast, but it's not always about movies. We might talk about video games, mm-hmm. music. music. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. the big one. Music. <laughs> uh, sometimes we might get a little bit of politicalness in there. Yes. Sometimes we may just. Oh, we know what we like to do. We like to tell stories, PJ. Ah, yes. I am the master storyteller <laughs> yes. of the podcast realm. <laughs> Undefeated. So if you like to hear about movies, video games, whatever foolishness comes to our mind, the most random stuff you can think of, check out the Home Video Hustle. You can find us on the Stitchers, yes. the Google Play, yes. Apple Podcasts, what else? Podbean, what else? Podcast Addict, goddamn, all that. Ain't no reason you can't get your hustle on. We everywhere, worldwide, baby. Hustle, motherfucking hustle. Hey, we can't cuss in the promo, PJ. Ah, we gotta be family friendly. There may be podcasts out there that don't want us here to say, ah, 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 all that good fun <laughs> stuff. Well. <laughs> you yeah. <laughs> don't, don't, don't run the listeners away Pete. Ah, i'm sorry but this is going kind of long yes so we'll end this and say hey check out the home video hustle every friday on all the various podcast outlets peace peace as far back as i can remember i always wanted to be a gangster And while Witch didn't make it to the top of the world, he did make the Gangs of Hollywood podcast. So join the gang and enjoy a movie review podcast about movie gangs, gangsters, mobsters, and the mayhem they cause. You can find GOH Podcast on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at GOHpod at www.gohpod.com as well as your favorite podcast listening app. And remember, say hello to your little friend for me. If you take two old punk rockers who are past their prime, put them in front of a movie screen and give them a podcast, what do you get? Cinema punks. Cinepunks. It's the mixtape of movies. Did you ever see a film at such a young age it left you traumatized with cinematic wounds? Oh, necrophilia. It's a dead issue, man. Don't don't push it. Cinema PsyOps is a weekly podcast documenting an ongoing experiment on the mind of an unwilling test subject. No one should have to watch this movie. Oh, no one should have to watch this. No one should have to watch this movie. Surprisingly, it's not a topic that a lot of people really want to tackle. I'm shocked. Prudes. I know, really. Right? It's the next sexual frontier that no one wants to explore. I am, in the most sincerest of senses, disappointed in you. It takes a powerful goddess like Connie, jam her arm down the monster's throat and kill it. Oh, I'm still tripping out over that. Even as a kid, I was like, I gotta find a girl like that. Every week, I, I get a new look of disappointment that I never thought I could get it's out of. Unimaginable. At 12 years old, you should not be watching this. Obviously. At 13, you should not be. 14, you shouldn't be. I'm not entirely sure even 17-year-olds should be watching this. Just because you're offended by something doesn't mean that you have the right to demand that it doesn't exist. Watching this film again, I had all of this, like, little nerd glee with everything that kept Little history up. doll yeah, popping up absolutely. at you. So I totally loved this film. Hey, I know why you, you know, couldn't see that. It's because your brain's warped watching this shit at 12 years old. Yeah, this is this is a rough movie. I told you ahead of time when we were getting ready to do it that it was How did you watch movie. this shit at 12? Because physical wounds heal, cinematic ones don't. Listen to Cinema Psyops. Hey everybody, I'm Corey. And I'm Zach. And we're the hosts of Podcasting After Dark, a cast dedicated to late night horror and sci-fi of the 80s and 90s, often found on HBO and Cinemax. You know, the movies your parents didn't want you watching as a kid. You can find us every other week on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Podbean, and Stitcher. This is what you want. This is what you get. It's late, it's time, let's check our cue, baby Pair it with a couple brews, baby
We love your movies. We love the bad ones too. So we watch them all and pass the lessons on to you. Oh yeah. Everything I learned from movies helps to make life a little bit groovy. With a one last plot holes and gratuitous movies. It's time to get busy with your friend Steven Lizzy. At eilfm.podbean.com. Welcome to Who Was She podcast. I am your host, Tara Jabari. After a decade working in documentaries, marketing, and all things digital media, I found that podcasting is a strong medium to share stories. After years of producing for others, I decided to start my own biographical podcast. Who Was She will focus on the life of a woman throughout Baha'i history. The first season is about Lydia Zeminoff. Lydia's story explores the subjects of the power of language and faith. Her father invented the universal language Esperanto, and she came from a Jewish family and became a Baha'i. She grew up during World War I and was killed during World War II in a concentration camp, despite heroic efforts to save her life. How can one person's life intersect with so many others, connect across borders, and inspire a biography which inspired this podcast? Over the next few weeks, I will share her story with you and the lives that were most affected by her and those who affected her life as well. They include her father, Ludwig Semenov, her spiritual mother, American journalist Martha Root, and the Baha'i German soldier Fritz Mako, who worked for the resistance undercover while having to serve the Nazi party. I want to thank the author, Wendy Heller, and George Ronald Publishing for their blessing to let me use Heller's biography, Lydia, The Life of Lydia Zeminoff, Daughter of Esperanto, as a main and instrumental resource for this podcast. So please subscribe and learn about this amazing woman who traveled through three continents in an effort to bring unity through the power of language. You can also find more information on our Instagram, Facebook, and Pinterest at Who Was She Podcast. Music was composed and performed by Sam Red. I am your host, Tara Jabari. Join us next time as we begin our journey about Lydia Zeminoff. Hi, everybody. It's Mac Jackson. I wanted to invite you to a new site called the Forever Adventure Network. This website has everything. Pictures, videos, blogs. There's original music by Harmony Constant two podcasts one is the macgyver podcast where we celebrate richard dean anderson his iconic roles and how it's influenced our lives there's episode discussions interviews and life conversations the second podcast is the never gets old podcast where we celebrate all the best things that we love in life from tv movies music and comics. The site is also the home for the MacGyver SG-1 audio series, an ongoing adventure series that continues the adventures of MacGyver and SG-1. There are also multiple stores to choose from for all of your pop culture and adventure needs. Come on by and check us out today. And thanks for joining the adventure. Are you sick of the same old stale podcasts? Well, then join Vanessa and Darren as they dissect movies of all kinds. The two lifelong cinema lovers bring their favorites, curiosities, and first-time watches to the operating table and inject them with a healthy dose of snark. Then there's the waiting room where they examine books and short stories. So just look for them on Apple Podcasts and where fine podcasts are available. 
They're part of the Legion Podcast Network. Follow them on Twitter at VD Clinic Pod. Join them on Facebook at facebook.com slash groups slash VD Clinic Pod. Or email them at VD Clinic Pod at gmail.com. They're ready to cure what ails you. <laughs> and still, they just might be a little contagious. Hi there. It's Heather from the Watching Netflix Without You podcast. Did you know that there are over 1,200 Netflix original feature films and documentaries? And that number is only growing. So I've made it my mission to watch as many as I possibly can. Then, with a delightful guest or guests, disclaimer, more often than not my brother Ryan, we spend an episode rating, reviewing, and discussing a film at length. The first half of every episode is spoiler-free for those who haven't seen it yet, and in the second half, after a very clear spoiler warning, we dive into it. And that's really about it. You can listen to Watching Netflix Without You on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and more. We now continue with our program. Follow us on the web on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. The podcast is available on Podbean, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Anchor, Apple, and anywhere else podcasts are available. Feel free to review our show and leave comments on any of those sites. Thanks a million for listening. It's a jacked up review show.